Hey, it's Erica. I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to Global News What Happened To ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. It was a Friday like any other. People were going about their business, preparing for the weekend. And then the earth rumbled like a fierce growl. Entire buildings shook. Pieces of concrete fell to the ground, at times narrowly missing those running for safety. This was an earthquake in a nation that was used to them. But this nine-magnitude earthquake, it wasn't only powerful, it was long, and triggered a massive tsunami which unleashed 15-meter-high waves that washed through small fishing villages and roadways. Cars, homes, and debris floated by as people rushed to their rooftops and watched the swirling water destroy everything in its path. And in a nanosecond, inside the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, everything went black. Nestled in the towns of Okuma and Futaba is the location of one of the worst nuclear power accidents in recent history. I'm Erica Vela, a reporter for Global News. And this is Whatever Happened to the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Crisis and the Great East Japan Earthquake. It's been over nine years since parts of Japan's northeastern coastline were destroyed by this massive three-pronged disaster. Many people in North America saw the devastation unfold on their televisions, heard it on the radio, or maybe they read about it online. That was also the case for Kazuko Mogul. Except this natural disaster hit close to home. Her hometown is a two-hour drive from the Fukushima prefecture. The house I was born was uh, on the seaside. Mogul grew up in a small town in the Miyagi prefecture, one of the areas devastated by the tsunami. And on March 11th, 2011, she woke up and turned on her television. I watched the program of NHK, which is uh, Japan Broadcasting Corporation World News. Then I realized a big earthquake and a huge tsunami at Tohoku region. So I knew Oh, I have to contact uh, my family right away. Power was out locally, and she had no luck getting through while living in Toronto. Yeah, just uh, I was sitting on the the TV all day. And they tried to, you know, they contact the the people in Japan. And of course, I couldn't. No, then, you know, I just watch that set whole day. Very shocked. But I told you that the, uh, oh, this uh, the uh, TV shows that uh, tsunami. I feel like uh, watching that the movie, not reality. It looks like a bad movie. The news from home would get worse for Mogul. A few days after the tsunami, she found out four members of her family, her brother, her sister-in-law, her niece, and her brother's granddaughter were all killed by the deadly waves. She discovered many of her former classmates and neighbors also didn't make it out alive. There are so many people, you know, that I, I couldn't count how many people. You know, actually, I lost the loved ones. Officials estimate close to 20,000 people lost their lives because of this natural disaster. And years later, it's a tough reality for Mogul to face. Can you imagine, you know, the... Uh, I, it's it's hard, hard to you know explain how much I lost. So emptiness. A hundred and eighty kilometers away from Mogul's hometown is the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. It was also rocked by the earthquake and tsunami, and that propelled the country into a nuclear crisis. I found someone who was there and who could tell me what it felt like when the ground shook. Dan Ayat was working in the offices at the Daiichi nuclear power plant. 
just a normal day. Got up, got cleaned up, went to work. There was four of us in the car, driving up the the uh, ocean road because the main road's too too busy. And uh, went into the plant. It was my last day. I was flying home Saturday, and we were supposed to get a body scan in the afternoon. They take one at the start, one at the end, to tell you how much radiation you've picked up. So at three o'clock, we were spo supposed to go for our body scan. About 20 to three, I said, okay guys, we better get down there and get that body scan done. And around a quarter to three, I was doing my uh, expense accounts. Then all of a sudden it started to go, everything started to shake up, down, sideways. And then it just wouldn't quit, it got more intense. So bad you had to sit on the floor, you couldn't stand up. You had no balance, you had to sit down. Then things in the office started to cave in and I crawled underneath the desk and wrote it out for six minutes. But the other guys I could see on the crew that were under the, their desk, you could just see the fear in their eyes and it must have been in mine too because I, I really didn't think we were going to get out. I thought the building was going to come down. Ayat had been traveling to Japan for almost 20 years, working as a nuclear mechanical technician for General Electric Nuclear. And having spent months at a time in the country, earthquakes, they weren't unusual. You get a little shake every once in a while. In Japan, you get a little tremor. But this thing here, after a minute, and then it went two minutes, and then it just kept getting more intense, I thought, this is the big one. We'll be lucky to get out of this. And the, the sliding door blew out of the side of the GE office. Things started to cave in. We tried three times to get out of the office, and we couldn't, because you couldn't stand up. We tried to go, and you'd fall down. So we just crawled underneath the desks and waited six minutes. Longest six minutes of my life. But it was, yeah, I didn't think we were going to get out of it. It was that scary. You look out from underneath the desk and you can see the uh, hydro wires and the hydro poles and they're all swinging back and forth. And it just, it was scary. It was scary. After the earthquake stopped, Dan said all he wanted to do was get out of the building. I figured that whole thing was going to come down and it was twisting and jumping up and down and making noises and I thought, we got to get out of here. So we went out into the parking lot. There's a picture there of everybody standing in the parking lot. And as I said, the building was making noises. I figured we were going to die in that building. So Dan was one of the lucky ones. He managed to escape safely. And as he left the office, he grabbed a small disposable camera that he'd bought to capture happy memories of the end of what was supposed to be a successful work trip. Instead... Photos from that very camera show once perfectly paved roadways completely crumbled. Cracks in the ground at least eight inches wide and several meters deep. Wanting to get a closer look at the damage, Dan and one of his colleagues decided to go down to the seashore. It's a place he spent a lot of time over the last several months. He would often eat lunch there or go for a walk during an occasional break. Go down to the seashore. I noticed the river running inland. And for some reason, I don't know why to this day, whether the big guy was looking after me or what, but I saw that. And I had seen tsunamis on TV and stuff. And after that uh, earthquake last so long, lasted so long, I thought there's got to be something coming. And we were smart enough to get out of there. Three minutes later, the first wave came in right where we were standing, 40 feet high and went two kilometers or so in, inland. I shouldn't even be here. Scary? Yeah. Lucky? Yeah. <laughs> Dan says he and his colleagues managed to find higher ground, and they watched as the first wave from the tsunami crashed inland. It didn't look like anything until it hit the shallow uh, area in front of where we were on the hill, and then all of a sudden it just grew like a big black monster out of the out of the Pacific and in it come. And it was snapping down trees that big like they were matchsticks. It hit them and, well, there was a, a building down there reminded me of an old hockey rink you'd see in Canada with the big square beams and everything on it. And it was a fish farm that, where they'd grow fish for sushi and that and send it to Tokyo. That wave came in and that thing was just leveled. And then it hit that cliff down the seashore, broke a big chunk off it, it went in. But we stood there and watched it on the hill, and these trees were just flying everywhere. 
Dan says he narrowly escaped death that day. Well, I got goosebumps right now just talking about it. We didn't, we didn't know whether we were high enough or not. We didn't know whether to jump in the car and take off, but we were high enough. And then it was dead silence. You could hear a pin drop. In 2011, the Daiichi nuclear plant had three of its six reactors in operation. The other three had been shut down for an inspection. Jonathan Cobb, a spokesperson for the World Nuclear Association, says that following the earthquake, power at the Daiichi nuclear power plant shut off and backup generators kicked in to keep the three reactors that were in operation cool. This is something that happens relatively frequently in the region uh, because of the earthquakes that are there. Um, So the reactors stop the fission uh, that is taking place, stop the chain reaction that is taking place, the production of electricity. And they then go into uh, aiming to go into a cold shutdown, where the idea is that the residual heat that is still in the core uh, is kept cool by circulating water. And that proceeded as it was meant to do. So the earthquake itself, although it's slightly stronger than had been expected for the region, didn't cause any significant damage to the reactors and they were behaving as they were expected to behave at that point. But at 3.42 p.m. local time, approximately 52 minutes after the earthquake hit, a tsunami hit the plant. Water breached the barriers and flooded the basement where these diesel generators were located. And that's when the three nuclear units lost all power. And it lost the ability to monitor the plant. None of the sensors were working. And also a lot of the cooling circuits at that time lost power and stopped working. While all this was unfolding at the nuclear plant, Dan Ayat and his colleagues were given strict orders by officials to leave the country. So they began making their way to Tokyo Airport. And the degree of devastation, well, it began to set in. There was roofs off of houses. There was uh, shopping centers with all their big windows all blown out. Some buildings were partially knocked down. Everybody on the bus, like, it was it was kind of quiet. There was a few guys talking, but there was a few guys that were working in the station at the time that were just like this. Like, what has just happened to us? Back in Japan, evacuation orders had been issued to people who were living in the area close to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Less than five hours after the earthquake, a nuclear emergency was declared, and people living within two kilometers from the plant were asked to leave the area. By 9.23 p.m. that night, Naoto Kan, the prime minister of Japan, he expanded that order to three kilometers. And by the next day, the evacuation zone was extended once again, this time to 20 kilometers. Tens of thousands of people in the surrounding area left their homes. And while much of this was because of the aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami, a lot of it was a precautionary measure enforced by the Japanese government to prevent potential exposure to radiation. To explain exactly what went wrong at the Daiichi plant, it's important to understand how a nuclear plant produces energy. Here's Jonathan Cobb again. He says it's the reactors at the plants that produce energy, and this happens through a chain reaction. And that's when a a neutron will hit uh, the nucleus of a uranium atom and actually cause it to split in two, to, to fission. That's what a fission reaction is. And when this reaction happens, high levels of heat are produced, which in turn heats water in the reactors. That drives turbines and makes electricity. This is how nuclear energy works. But if the chain reaction is stopped, some heat is still produced by the radioactive fuel. That heat has to be removed by the cooling systems. And if the reactor loses its ability to cool, that's when a problem can arise. The radioactive elements that are in the fuel still produce some heat, only maybe 10, 15 percent of the heat or even less. It decays away quite rapidly, but it's enough heat that eventually it produces enough heat to melt the fuel. 
As I mentioned earlier, there were three operational units at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Unit 1 lost its cooling ability within an hour after the tsunami. 36 hours after the tsunami, Unit 2 lost its cooling systems. And 72 hours later, Unit 3 had lost its cooling systems. So as gas was being produced, this was increasing the pressure within the reactor vessels. Uh, And eventually, um, there were some uh, leaks of this gas that uh, escaped, and with it, it brought out some of the gaseous um, radioactive fission products that had been produced as the reactors were undergoing the the accident. A day after the tsunami hit, a hydrogen explosion happened at Daiichi's Unit 1 reactor, which severely damaged the building's upper structure where the spent fuel was being kept. Hydrogen explosions would also happen at Units 3 and 4 in the following days. That in itself did not um, release a a large amount of uh, radioactive material. The research that has happened since suggests that the majority of the emissions, the aerial emissions that did come from uh, the site as a result of the accident came from Unit 2. So there may have been some failing of the uh, reactor vessel, the containment vessel that resulted in uh, these um, radioactive materials being released. It wasn't only radioactive gas that was the concern. While trying to cool the reactor cores, water from the ocean had to pass through, and some of that water became contaminated. What happens since then is that there has been uh, a restoring of the cooling. Uh, So water has been passing through these reactors to keep them cool, uh, to bring them to what's called a cold shutdown. But because there have been uh, the flooding and because there has been the um, damage that that has taken place, when the water has been going through, uh, doing the cooling, it's been picking up some contamination. So there has been a continuing movement of water through the site eventually into the ocean nearby and while now that's been very much reduced to the point where it is not really detected in the sea anymore uh, and and things like the the fish in the uh, seas around the plant uh, they don't have the levels uh, of radioactive contamination that were initially picked up and meant that they couldn't be fished Um, there is still some cooling that's needed to be done Uh, And there is a buildup of of water that is being uh, stopped from going into the ocean. So they are collecting the water uh, rather than discharging the water. While the contamination levels in the surrounding water are now considered to be very low at the time, there was concern that the leak would travel across the ocean to Canada Here's Chris Starosta, a nuclear scientist at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. We learned, of course, about the accident uh, in March uh, 2011, and we had uh, tools, which we call detectors, uh, which are highly sensitive, and we uh, decided to try to identify possible signatures of uh, radiation emitted in Fukushima um, on the west coast of Canada in in near Vancouver. So we know the timeline of uh, releases in uh, uh, Fukushima, and we know that at the beginning of the accident there was essentially volatile um, elements and volatile compounds were released with the release of steam from uh, overheated reactors. So they were released into air. And what we speculate is that they were uh, picked up by the jet stream and carried over the um, Pacific Ocean. Chris and his team looked at rainwater and seaweed on Canada's west coast. They were looking for iodine-131. This is an isotope that has a short half-life, and it's not found in the environment unless there is a release from a reactor. Around March uh, 15th, we were able to pick up clearly uh, the signature in the seaweed, and we were essentially able to map the profile time profile of concentration of iodine-131 in rainwater. 
A similar study to Chris's was done following the nuclear crisis at Chernobyl in Ukraine in 1986. So he decided to compare the data and discovered concentrations of iodine-131 were 10 times lower than what was found in Vancouver following Chernobyl. Since those concentration levels were low, I asked Chris if those isotopes are a concern for those living on Canada's West Coast. So... In my personal opinion, which I expressed many times, they are not. Uh, you need to remember that we are measuring grain water, which is not a, which is not drinking water. So we were, you know, low below those limits. So our our position was always that there is absolutely no concern. His team also looked at drinking water, and they weren't able to find anything. It is important to know contamination didn't just happen through steam in the air. It was also found in the ocean from contaminated water from the plant. But Chris says his group was unable to measure concentrations in the ocean, so he decided to take a closer look at fish, salmon more specifically. I want to jump in here for a second before we get into what Chris and his team found in those salmon samples. You should know that there is such a thing as natural radiation in the environment, and we're exposed to this every single day. Some of it comes from cosmic rays, but it can be found here on Earth in less obvious places, like rocks, for example. Some rocks can have natural radioactive materials, like uranium is a natural radioactive element that can be found in granite, for example. And we willingly expose ourselves to radiation when we go in for medical procedures like CT scans or x-rays. Natural radiation can be found in our oceans as well, but there are traces of man-made radiation from nuclear weapons tests that happened from the 1960s to the 1980s. The thing that many people fear about the word radiation is that we can't sense it. The human body has no biological way to sense radiation. And on a day-to-day basis, we can't identify its absence or its presence like we can with other elements. High levels of exposure can be dangerous, even lethal. But very low-level exposures are something we have lived with for centuries and will continue to live with in our environment. It shouldn't necessarily be feared. Let's go back to Chris and what he discovered with his salmon samples. They found traces of two isotopes, cesium-134 and cesium-137. He knew these two isotopes are man-made isotopes that could only come from nuclear reactions. This could be from a nuclear reactor or even a nuclear weapon. Chris says the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant was the only release of cesium-134 in the last couple of years. So traces of that isotope could only come from that plant. But cesium-137? That's a bit of a different story. This isotope has a longer half-life, so concentrations could be from the Fukushima Daiichi plant, but it also could be because of those nuclear weapons tests that happened decades ago. So I wondered if these isotopes should be a concern for people eating salmon from the Pacific Ocean. And the answer Chris gave me, well, it surprised me. One of the things which uh, has to be understood is that in fish, there is a radioactive isotope, which is naturally occurring radioactive isotope, The natural radioactive isotope that Chris is referring to is potassium-40. And it's in every food that we eat that contains potassium. Foods like bananas, for example. So knowing this, Chris compared the levels of this natural isotope, potassium-40, to levels of man-made isotopes found in those salmon samples. And essentially our argument was that this additional those coming from the radioisotopes released from Fukushima is essentially completely insignificant compared to the uh, radioactivity which is contained in the food in the first place. I want to take a moment here and repeat what Chris just said. 
According to him, the radiation released from the Fukushima Daiichi plant is essentially completely insignificant compared to the radioactivity naturally contained in the food in the first place. After the natural disaster, it took several months for the Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, to gain control over the three units. Crews worked tirelessly and tried different methods and systems to keep the reactors cool. And in December 2011, it was announced that three nuclear reactors were finally in a cold shutdown. The Daiichi plant is no longer in operation, and they are currently working to decommission the site. That could take anywhere between 30 to 40 years. The country is also storing over a million tons of contaminated water. It's water that has cycled through the plant to keep the reactors cool. It's also water from the tsunami that once flooded the reactor buildings. The World Nuclear Association says the water has been treated, but there's still some contamination. Here's Jonathan again to explain. One particular radionuclide that remains is tritium. And tritium is actually just a form of hydrogen. It's a, it's a heavier form of hydrogen. And that is in the water in a fairly small concentration. I mean, there are these very large uh, tanks of water that are there, but the actual amount of tritium within them is, is quite minuscule. It's uh, maybe a, a, a cup full, if, if, uh, if at all that much. The Japanese government is now trying to figure out what to do with this water. And one option they are considering, controlled release into the ocean. So it is a very small amount in itself, but it is uh, spread amongst the water that's there. And there's obviously a concern now that, particularly for fishermen in the region who may have found that you know their, their industry, their livelihoods have just recovered because they are now... Uh, able to fish there because the the other contamination is being removed or is at a very low level and they're they're permitted to fish again. There's an obvious concern that they would have uh, about having that water discharged into the sea. It probably is the right thing to do. Uh, it probably is the appropriate way of treating the water because the the actual level of radioactivity uh, once it's discharged in a controlled way is not particularly high. It should not be harmful. Um, but it's something I think that the, the local communities there obviously have a concern about. In October of this year, there were reports that the Japanese government made the decision to release over 1 million tons of contaminated water into the sea. The release will take around two years to prepare because the contaminated water has to go through a filtration process and it has to be diluted before it can be released into the ocean. One question does linger. Could this have all been avoided? No one could have predicted a 15-meter tsunami would hit the plant on March 11, 2011. But Jonathan Cobb says in the years and months leading up to the natural disaster, studies had been done raising concerns around the potential of a large tsunami to hit the Daiichi plant. So there were concerns that were being raised about that and whether there would be a need to um, reinforce the flood defenses to ensure that you know, it would be able to withstand a, a larger tsunami. It had measures in place for smaller tsunamis, so its flood defenses were, were not uh, of the scale that was required for a, the 15-meter tsunami that uh, did impact it on March the 11th. In fact, there was another plant just north of Fukushima's Daiichi plant, the Onagawa Nuclear Power Plant. It withstood a stronger earthquake and even higher tsunami waves. But it had been built, I think, 19 or 20 meters above the sea level. Um, and so it was not affected by the uh, tsunami in the way that the Fukushima Daiichi one was. A question I thought of, and maybe it's one you're thinking about too, is why would they build a nuclear plant in a place that is prone to natural disasters like earthquakes and tsunamis? And to answer that, we need to touch on a bit of history on Japan and its reliance on nuclear energy. Japan was historically dependent on imports for its energy needs. 
By 2011, nuclear energy accounted for almost 30 percent of the country's total electricity production. The intention and the expectation was that that was actually going to rise. And one of the reasons was that Japan doesn't have access to its own fossil fuel reserves. It was having to import uh, coal and oil and gas, some from far away in the Middle East, where potentially the the supply of those um, fuels could be disrupted by conflict. So there were concerns over the security of their energy supply. And that's one reason why they were pursuing nuclear energy as a way of having a more reliable source of electricity. The other reason why they were pursuing increasing the amount of nuclear generation they were going to use was because they had concerns about greenhouse gases that those fossil fuels cause. Nuclear plants also have to be close to a water source in order to operate on a day-to-day. Japan is a a very mountainous area. There are not large areas of land which are suitable for for building towns and cities. And so I think the coastal areas are are very extensively used. A lot of changes were made following the nuclear crisis. Very soon after Fukushima, what happened that um, nuclear industry carried out what was called stress tests. So these are different tests that uh, took place in countries around the world, looking to see on the basis of what happened at Fukushima Daiichi, what could be done uh, at reactor sites elsewhere. So the main thing uh, about Fukushima Daiichi, they were unable to cool their plant because they lost power and they lost their backup power. So one of the things that has happened is that reactor sites around the world have made efforts to have more sources of emergency power available. And in the case of uh, coastal sites, those emergency sources are placed higher up on higher ground so they wouldn't be affected by a tsunami were that to happen. Also, there have been... Uh, examinations of the flood defences that are in place, making sure that uh, there are better flood defences, re-examining what kind of levels of flood defences are required. Before the earthquake and tsunami that followed, Japan had 55 working reactors. But after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident, the country began a new regulatory program. So far, only nine are in operation. Because of this new licensing process, this new uh, regulator that has been brought in, um, some of the reactors uh, are unable to restart either because they would um, not be able to meet the new standards that were being put in place or because um, to bring them up to standard would involve a large investment and they may not have the the operating uh, life. Uh, That would mean that it it would be a cost-effective investment. Since the nuclear crisis, the country has lowered its use of nuclear energy. There have been a lot more imports of fossil fuels, and that's been very costly to their economy. Uh, It also means that greenhouse gas emissions from Japan have increased quite significantly because they've had to use their fossil fuel plant a lot more than they did. The natural disaster happened nine years ago. And as of today, Japan's reconstruction agency says 2,500 people are still listed as missing. And the country's reconstruction agency estimates that the Great East Japan earthquake leveled over 121,000 buildings. Information from Japan's cabinet office says the estimated financial loss is pegged at almost 17 trillion yen. That's almost $200 billion dollars. And the economic loss, according to the World Bank, could reach 235 billion U.S. dollars, which could make this the costliest natural disaster in world history. When Dan Ayat arrived back home from Fukushima, it didn't take him long to realize his days working at a nuclear plant, well, they were numbered. I went to work on the Monday. And I only lasted three days, and they kept asking me. I never went back. The events that took place on March 11th, 2011, forever changed Dan Ayat's life. The Dan Ayat that left for Japan, he's still over there. It was a different guy that came home. Yeah, I've had some problems when I get home, like a PTSD. I still wake up with the odd nightmare, and I got pills to make me sleep. This is a feeling Kazuko also understands. 
She went back to her hometown just months after the earthquake and tsunami hit, and some areas were still submerged in water. Today, she says she takes nothing for granted. Words of advice she also shared with me. Whatever you want to say to someone, especially the loved one, say it right now. Then whatever you want to do, do it right now. Don't postpone. Nobody knows what happened tomorrow. I'm missing to my brother and then sister-in-law and my niece. You know, so many people I lost. So... They are just two people out of hundreds of thousands affected by this three-pronged disaster. While the details and developments around this story may have fallen out of the daily headlines, the plot will continue to develop and change in the following months and years. But one thing is also sure. The feelings both Dan and Kazuko and countless others feel those feelings will also remain constant. Whatever Happened To is written and produced by me, Erica Bella, with producer Dila Velezquez and our audio producer, Rob Johnson. If you like this podcast, please tell a friend about the show and help me share these stories by rating and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can reach me on Twitter at Erica Vella or email me at erica.bella at globalnews.ca. Thanks for listening. <laughs>